It's been nearly a decade since the release of Zack Snyder's Sucker Punch. To sort through our many conflicting feelings about this mind-bending action thriller, we're giving the film another look and examining all the things we still don't understand about it. But first, a word of warning, major spoilers are ahead. After accidentally killing her sister while trying to protect her from their abusive stepfather, a young woman only known as Baby Doll ends up in a mental asylum. From the moment she arrives, she's at the mercy of a corrupt and vicious orderly named Blue. With just five days remaining until Baby Doll is scheduled to be lobotomized, she teams up with four other inmates to plot a daring breakout. Now, this is where things start to get a little tricky. As Baby Doll works towards escaping physically, she appears to be escaping her bonds mentally as well. She starts imagining fantastical worlds in which she and her crew are powerful heroes going on a series of grand adventures. It's all a bit complicated, so let's break it down step by step. Sucker Punch operates on three levels of reality. The first is the real world, which is the corrupt mental asylum where it seems that Baby Doll and the other patients are victimized by the staff. The second level is a nightclub that also functions as a brothel for its wealthy clients. Baby Doll imagines that the asylum is in fact this dangerous nightclub run by a violent and possessive mobster. The third level of reality is Baby Doll's totally fantastical and heroic world of adventures, which is always set to modern rock and pop music. We completely understand the asylum. That's the real world. We also basically understand the fantasy sequences. Baby Doll imagines a place in which she's powerful because in the actual world, she's not. But it's that second layer of reality, the nightclub and the brothel, that has us confused. It certainly isn't functioning as escapism for any of the female characters. The imaginary brothel is no less hostile than the asylum, just slightly different. We can't really think of a deeper thematic or artistic motivation behind its inclusion, apart from being an excuse to dress up all the female characters in mini skirts and lingerie. This is a joke, right? Unless we're missing something, we can't figure out what the film would lose if it cut out the brothel and only had two levels of reality instead of three. The tone would be the same. The trauma would be the same. All that would change are the costumes and color palette. Oh, and the fact that the characters wouldn't be in a brothel. Each time Baby Doll dances in the nightclub reality, she's temporarily transported to a different fantastical world full of enemies and monsters that she must slay. She's faced with everything, from giant samurai to zombie steampunk soldiers to killer robots. The implication is that these are Baby Doll's dreams, but why would a young person from the mid-1900s be dreaming in the tropes of modern geek culture? That would be crazy! However, there's a version of this that could have worked. In movies, a character's dreams are a general reflection, in some way, of who that person is. Director Zack Snyder has stated in interviews that the comics magazine Heavy Metal was a major inspiration for Sucker Punch. So perhaps Baby Doll herself could have also been established as a comic book fan. Or even better, she could have been an aspiring writer or artist who was just a couple decades ahead of her time, dreaming of fictional worlds that didn't exist yet. For much of the movie, it seems as if the filmmakers treat Baby Doll much the same way as her captors do, simply as a means to an end an object that only exists to fulfill their wishes. She isn't really a person, and her inner life doesn't matter. These sequences are, rather transparently, just the writer's fantasies and not hers. Whenever Baby Doll and her friends are fighting enemies in a fantasy sequence, they're also dealing with a problem in the nightclub reality. However, most of the time, the actions they're performing within a fantasy seem to have little to do with the corresponding goals they're trying to achieve outside of it. Do the specifics of these fantasies actually matter to the real world, or are they just supposed to look really cool? For instance, in one sequence, Baby Doll is distracting a wealthy man by dancing while another woman, Amber, steals a lighter from his jacket. In the fantasy, however, Amber is providing air cover from a plane so that Baby Doll can sneak up on a baby dragon and steal a pair of magic crystals. The action is a complete inversion of what's actually happening in the nightclub level of reality, for no apparent reason and it makes it difficult to get emotionally invested in the dragon slaying scene. One notable exception to this lack of cohesion occurs when the women are trying to steal a kitchen knife. When they fail and Rocket gets stabbed by the cook in the nightclub reality, we cut back to the fantasy world, where Rocket heroically sacrifices herself to save her friends. It's one of the stronger moments in the film, primarily because the specifics of the fantasy sequences actually mean something. A popular fan theory about Sucker Punch is that Baby Doll isn't actually the point of view character. 
In truth, the entire story is being told in past tense by Sweet Pea, the only woman who actually escaped. Some take this theory even further, asserting that Baby Doll herself never existed, and she's an alternate persona that Sweet Pea invented for herself. A flawless superhero that Sweet Pea pretended to be so she could gather the strength to break free of the asylum. This was never my story. It's yours. Now don't screw it up, okay? So possibly, Sweet Pea invented the character of Baby Doll because even if she couldn't personally imagine slaying the dragons in her own life, she could imagine another person, a hero, who could. Lie to yourself if you must. Tell yourself that you have superpowers and there's no obstacle you can't overcome. Or to put it another way. You have all the weapons you need. Now fight. After the crew's plan to escape fails, things don't end well for most of them. Rocket is killed by the cook, then Blondie and Amber are executed by Blue in the dressing room of the nightclub. In the end, only Sweet Pea is able to survive and escape. But remember, all of this is only happening in the imaginary world of the nightclub and not the real world of the asylum. We do get a few brief scenes in the asylum after those tragedies, but Rocket, Amber, and Blondie are nowhere to be seen. Were they actually killed? If you die in the nightclub, do you die in real life? The only hints that we get are courtesy of Dr. Gorski when she offers a brief account of Baby Doll's eventful five days in the asylum. She stabbed an orderly, started a fire, and, and helped another patient to escape. However, she doesn't say anything about an orderly named Blue openly executing two other patients in front of her. Additionally, given that Blue is eventually arrested for authorizing medical procedures in Gorski's name without her permission, you'd imagine that openly murdering patients would be much bigger news. It makes sense if Blue is a powerful and violent mobster and Gorski's working for him, but it doesn't make sense at all if he's a mere orderly and she's a doctor who presumably outranks him. However things went down in the real version of Baby Doll's attempted escape, it was probably quite different. And whether or not Rocket, Blondie, and Amber died in real life, that's just one of the many things we'll never know. There's little in Sucker Punch that's as confusing as the mysterious wise man who appears in Baby Doll's fantasy battle sequences. This enigmatic figure typically offers Baby Doll and her team advice in the form of trite bumper sticker truisms. For those who fight for it, life has a flavor the shelter will never know. Even more puzzling, these words of wisdom consistently have no discernible relevance to the crew's current situation, nor do they relate to the movie's deeper themes. So why is this character in the film? We get an answer, sort of, in the final scene. As Sweet Pea is boarding the bus that will take her to freedom, some police officers start asking her questions, suspecting that she's an escaped mental patient. Fortunately, the bus driver steps in and convinces them to leave her alone. This character is played by Scott Glenn, who also portrayed the wise man. One potential interpretation makes sense if, as we mentioned earlier, Sweet Pea has been the protagonist all along and she's telling her story in the past tense. Since all these fantasies are really hers, perhaps she chose to retroactively cast this man who saved her on the bus as a mentor figure throughout her entire story. If so, we can't help but wonder why she wouldn't cast Gorski in that role instead. She was helping all the women stay alive the entire time and not just at the very last minute, I teach them to survive. You. Sucker Punch definitely has some problematic moments, and most have to do with how the film treats its female characters. The issue isn't that it's about abuse. Plenty of films about exploitation aren't themselves exploitative. Consider Mad Max Fury Road. Just like Sucker Punch, the plot centers on women who are attempting to free themselves from a terrible situation. Their roads to freedom are similarly long and dangerous, and not all of them make it. What Fury Road understands, however, is that even though characters within the film may treat women as if they're objects, the film itself should always treat them like people. The main female characters get clearly defined personalities, wants, and conflicting philosophies. Though Sucker Punch's heart may be in a similar place, it falls short of the mark in its execution. The film's female heroes are more or less interchangeable Barbie dolls with minimal dialogue and indistinct personalities. They exist only to be stared at, tortured, and eventually killed for shock value. Contrast this with how the movie treats the primary abuser, Blue. He's perhaps the most complex, three-dimensional character in the film, and his numerous, lengthy monologues mean that he has easily twice as much dialogue as any woman. 
This sadly proves that Sucker Punch can make a character interesting when it cares about that. It just didn't care enough about its female heroes to do this. Sucker Punch is often accused of being a shallow and exploitative film that only exists as an excuse to show women in miniskirts fighting in slow motion. For all the harsh things we've said about the film so far, we don't think that's entirely fair. The film is clearly trying to make some sort of deeper point. So let's give it the benefit of the doubt and try to figure out what the filmmakers might be trying to say. Within the context of the fantasy sequences, Sucker Punch mimics the tropes of senseless and seductive action films. This practice of filming women in an objectifying way to bring pleasure to the viewer is often referred to as the male gaze, a term coined by film theorist Laura Mulvey. Sucker Punch, however, might be attempting to challenge this paradigm. Through additional layers of reality, the asylum, and the nightclub, the film equates the objectification of women in film with the dehumanization they experience in real life, which could be interpreted as a condemnation of both forms of exploitation. All of this culminates in the scene of Baby Doll's lobotomy. When she's stabbed in the eye, so is the viewer. The male gaze is penetrated, our happy ending denied. We think we're getting a fun, escapist fantasy, and instead, the ending of the film hits us like, well, a sucker punch. So what's the final verdict? Is Sucker Punch pure exploitation or a statement about it? In truth, it's sort of both, but more than anything, it's just confused. The film takes a stab at a feminist message, but whatever it's trying to say gets lost in a web of shallow characters, dead-end plot threads, and inexplicable narrative choices. If you just ever wanted to just take something back. That being said, for all the film's faults, a lack of ambition is not one of them. There were plenty of bigger-than-life action scenes, stunning imagery, and genuinely outrageous concepts. We'd much rather that filmmakers take big swings like this one, even if they miss and fall down in spectacular fashion. Wow. So much for that little experiment. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about over-the-top action movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.